It's great to be here. I'd, I've put up my hand when I was asked, um, you know, whose first time. Never been here before. It's a great honor and privilege for me to speak to you all. And I'm hoping that you will get some value, some clarity, and above all, some questions to ask yourself and others. Because as we know, coaching is about questions. Now, let's see. Already um, said a little bit about myself. I don't want to uh, say any more about that aspect, except that I am an executive coach. And I am an executive coach because I believe that business is a very strong and important leverage point in this world. And sometimes business and spirituality are seen as somehow opposite or incompatible. I don't think so at all. And I think that uh, in order to get a better world, business is absolutely essential to do this. And when we have companies like Apple, which have a, an operating turnover of about, you know, more than about six small countries, then it's very clear that business is very important. My background to this uh, may surprise you. It was, I spent many years actually as a classical guitarist. I was a teacher of classical guitar. I was a performer, concert performer of classical guitar. And in my teaching and performing, I came across a couple of questions that have inspired me in my coaching ever since. One of which is, how do people learn? Every student was different. And the other was, of course, how do you get the best from yourself? and others. How do I get the best from myself as a performer, but how do I help others also get the best from themselves? And uh, I used to uh, conduct some interesting experiments with my students, one of which was, uh, and many of my students were extremely good players, they were concert players. So I would show them into the, uh, the studio and tell them to please get out the guitar, to sit down, to start practicing. And I would then say, I'll go get a glass of water for us, something like this. I would listen at the door. And I would hear them invariably play beautifully. Beautifully. So then what happens when I come in and sit down and say, OK, now please play me that again? Usually, not so good. Now, why is that? Nothing has changed about their capability, about five seconds difference between the two. Their, their skill at playing the guitar hasn't changed. Something's changed. And what's changed clearly is something inside their head. Some kind of limitation, self-created limitations come in there and put down their level of performance. So, of course, the practice, the time is very important. And at the highest level, which we all want to be, at that top level, it's a mind game. Yeah? It becomes a mind game. And this is where we operate as coaches, inside that mind game, helping people to the, to the very best. And we've seen in the Olympics too, haven't we? We've seen in the Olympics the difference between first and second is sometimes a tenth of a second. Where does that tenth of a second come from? It, it comes from the mind, the commitment, the drive. So I found, first of all, in, in my working with, with guitar and with, with my students, um, learning a lot about what was coaching, although I didn't think of it as coaching at the time, and also music as a, as a spiritual force, as a very important uh, way of being able to express ourselves. So, let's, I suppose, think a little bit about leading with integrity. Integrity is wholeness, so all of us, we bring all of ourselves and we ask for all of our clients. 
And leading, and I like to talk about leading because it's a verb, and I think that the more we talk about verbs, doing, rather than things like leadership, which is a kind of abstraction, these abstract words that fool us into freezing the world. When we talk in verbs about leading, what is leading and what does a leader do? If we can just go to the next slide. A leader goes into the unknown to create the future. And they go first. <laughs> That's the thing about a leader. They go first into the unknown. So it is unknown. And by going into that unknown and by inspiring others and having some kind of vision, as we were doing just now, that vision helps to create that future. It isn't like leaders just walk into the future, you know, ha-ha, oh, wonderful, here's a wonderful new world, and it's all great, and I'm really glad we came here. The journey is the creation. That, that vision doesn't exist, except insofar as we can create it first in our mind, and then move, act, walk. And as we act and walk into it, so we create it. So a leader goes first and creates this future. And an inspiring future, other people will follow, because a leader, of course, will have followers. And integrity, this wholeness, for me also integrity is about authenticity. Uh, authenticity very similar in terms of, of being yourself and the same root as the word author. An author is someone who creates something. So an an, someone who is authentic is someone who is creating their life. Creating a wholeness, creating an integrity. So, can we go please to the next slide? As a coach, I'm interested in language. And sometimes, uh, when we take things literally, it can give us some new insight into something. So I looked at this word, keynote. You know, what is, what's a keynote speech? It's easy to say, oh yes, we're doing a keynote. So, key. Okay, what's a key? Well, something's key if it's important, crucial. And of course, a key opens doors. Absolutely. And I think this very much links back to questions and what we do as a coach. We, we help people to find the keys to their life. Um, it, it reminds me of a little metaphor. Forgive me if you've heard this before. I can get away with this in corporate environments, but probably in this environment it's quite familiar uh, of the man uh, who is at night searching underneath uh, a light. And he's searching away, and someone comes past and says, hey, can I help you? What are you looking for? He says, I've, I've dropped my key, dropped my house key. Oh, please, let me help you. So they search around here under the street light, and uh, the passerby says, can't see it. Well, where exactly did you drop it? And the guy says, well, actually, I dropped it over there. Okay, so why are we searching here? Well, it's light here. Uh, I can see what I'm doing. It's very dark over there. I can't see what I'm doing. It's very difficult. So uh, it's a nice little metaphor. And for me, it, it's very apposite because it tells us that we search in the light. When we want answers, we tend to search in the places that we know, in the light, in the light of our minds. And what a coach does is to actually ask some questions, which would be the equivalent of a torch, flashlight, another street light, you know, big beam <laughs> searchlight sometimes, or laser light, so that that person can find their own key and then get into their house. As a coach, of course, we don't give them the key. We don't <laughs> have another key. We don't give them our key. They find their own key, and we help them to do that. So, questions are the key, and this, as a keynote, I think this keynote speech should leave you, or, or my intention is certainly to leave you with a series of questions. And if I've left you with a series of questions, then I will be happy with that, uh, rather than any series of answers. 
The answers will come from the questions. The quality of the answer will come from the quality of the question. If I can provoke some wonderful quality questions in you in the course of this hour, then I will be very happy. Note. Key note. Well, note, something of note, it's important. It's noteworthy. And it's a musical note. Tuning fork. Here's a musical note. Let's, let's see if this works. I don't know if you can hear that. Just take a moment to reflect on the quality of that sound. Okay. Now that's a tuning fork, and it gives you a pretty pure, in one sense, uh, single note. Now, if we could just make a contrast, I want to play four notes. Our friend there, I hope, will be able to play just four notes for us now. Okay. That's the first four notes from Beethoven, Opus 131, first movement. For me, one of the most uh, well, a piece of music that has spirit infused in it to the greatest, for me. There are many pieces of music that have that. But what I wanted to bring out from those two things, the tuning fork and the notes, is something important about leadership and uh, leading with integrity, leading authentically. Because sometimes I think when we put together leader with integrity, authenticity, spirituality. We tend to think of, of something rather uh, pure to the sense of being anemic, pure to being the sense of, of not fully rounded. And if you think to that tuning fork, that tuning fork was one note with no overtones. So it's very clear. Those notes, first of all, they're different. Okay. And their difference then makes a relationship and connection between them, which is above and beyond any one of those four notes. They form a theme. And because they're a violin and played by a human being, that violin string is imperfect in the sense that uh, there are many overtones generated but it has much more feeling, meaning, authenticity. It's, you know, it is itself. So, for me then, leadership is, is about that, those four notes, in the sense of overtones, you know, real people turning up completely, not trying to be uh, one-dimensional, or trying to be perfect, but bringing all of themselves to a coaching session, a therapy session, whatever it might be, and in turn evoking all, or as much as possible, of their client. So this is a keynote speech, rather than a keynote, and those are the two things. So, what's this? This conference is about spirituality, spirit of coaching. So, just a little thing about to explore then leading with integrity. What does that mean in terms of, of the spirit of coaching? So, maybe we start with what is coaching? Um, that's a question that has many, many, many answers, of course, and coaching is complex enough to evade any single answer. You know, there's a saying that says if you want to... Uh, we define things in order to avoid understanding them. So, I'm not going to go into definitions. But certainly coaching is about bringing out the best. 
It's about challenging. Um, my metaphor for a coach is a freedom fighter on behalf of the client's best self. So if we think about what was said this morning of, of we are whole, we, we are there, we're, as it were, trying to get out. The coach is the person who helps to cut the bonds that are stopping us from getting out. We are there already, it's a matter of what is stopping us. It's not easy to see what is stopping us. If you can't see what is stopping us, then it's very hard to deal with it. So the first aspect of coaching is always awareness, which is something that the coach models and brings to the coaching relationship first of all. And then with awareness, we can start to think, well, okay, how are we going to deal with these particular sort of uh, limitations that, that we may have? And by stripping away the limitations, so we become our best self, rather than uh, trying to create something out of nothing. It's like the, the metaphor of Michelangelo um, when he's doing his sculpture, his carving. He says, I simply release the beautiful figure that's already within the stone. So how does a coach release that beautiful figure that's already in the client? And how can the coach model those qualities that will help the client? And of course, how can the coach indeed release their own beautiful figure from within themselves? Because um, I don't believe that we should be asking clients to do something that we're not prepared to do ourselves. So coach is a leader, I think. Um, a leader in the sense that they do go into the unknown. They help the client to go into the unknown, but they also model the qualities that the client needs to see uh, in practice. And this is perhaps the most powerful coaching of all. Spiritual. Well, again, what is spiritual? Um, not going to catch me trying to give a definition of that. It's many, many things to many people and depends indeed how you think about it. Uh, I think we can probably agree that it's about connection. It's about the deepest part of us that is also the deepest part of everybody else. And therefore, if you can connect with the deepest part of yourself, you are also connecting with the deepest part of everybody. And how we do that and where we focus first, whether it's on other or self or both together and the various practices that we do, um, is perhaps secondary. So that connection and that inner work, I think, is very important in spirituality. And, and maybe in the end it's something about uh, being, uh, for me, a spiritual coach is someone who is fully themselves in the service of others. And by being fully yourself, by having, in, by having that integrity, by being authentic, by doing the work, you can then be of the greatest service to others. So again, the two go together there. Okay, um, can we move? Ah yes, okay, coach is a leadership model and guide. That was uh, really the sort of things that I was saying just now, being fully yourself in the service of others. And here's the next slide. So this for me kind of sums up what a, what a coach would be doing for themselves and for other people. And the first is, is to wake up. And that's about state. That's about awareness. Um, we are even perhaps conditioned socially not to pay attention to things. It's rude to stare, uh, don't look, don't notice what's going on with other people, uh, don't notice certainly what's going on with yourself. 
So waking up, first of all, is about paying attention in the moment, in the now. And by that presence, being present, as Andrea will be talking about this afternoon, a really crucial part of coaching, that presence will help to awake being present of the client. Because if the coach isn't present, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> and then, of course, if the client isn't present, who are you coaching? So you've both got to be there, really, before anything significant is going to happen. So that's what I mean by waking up, that kind of presence. Growing up, this is about development. And we know from, of course, all the psychological studies that human beings do go through certain stages of development. So, you know, you start as a baby and you think in certain ways and then you start to grow up and a child, you do not expect children to have the same sort of uh, way of thinking, uh, intellectual development, social, moral development, or anything like that. It's absolutely appropriate that they don't. You know, they're, they're growing up, and that's fine. And then, you know, you, children grow, teenage, adult, not sure when adulthood starts. I'm still waiting. <laughs> But uh, what, what is clear is, is you know, uh, certainly intellectual development, but intellectual development is just one aspect of development. Now we've got all, all these uh, various lines of development, uh, various um, lines of, of uh, intelligences. But it does seem sometimes that, at least in what society thinks, is that, okay, so you go through, maybe if you've finished university, that's it, you're done. Uh, complete. Finished. Now you just, now it's just kind of downhill slide after that. And of course that's not true at all. Uh, we are continually developing and we know that if you, if you think about some issue that you had in the past, some years ago, if you were to face that same issue now, you would deal with it differently. So how do we develop through those stages. Now, coaching, developmental coaching, one aspect of coaching, uh, there's three aspects of coaching. One is performance coaching, which is, you know, do this better. And that's fine in a lot of business. There's also what you might call transactional coaching, which is to help people to function better at the stage that they're at. And that's also fine. In fact, that's very often the best thing you can do with people. Sometimes, as coaches, we perhaps want to push people uh, too far, too soon, rather than making them comfortable where they are, because if they're not actually grounded and comfortable where they are, it's going to be very difficult for them to move up. In fact, they won't want to. Uh, it's, I have the, the metaphor of, uh, of, of uh, like an apartment. So you have an apartment, and it's on the, the first floor, and first thing you do with your apartment is you make it comfortable. You make it how you want it to be. So you decorate the apartment, you get in the furniture, and you get comfortable there, and that's great. And having done that, then, perhaps, you might want to move. And you might want to move to a higher apartment where you have a bigger view. But that higher apartment is going to be... Uh, a challenge, let's say, first of all, because you will need to then refurbish it again. And you probably won't have the same furniture. So that would be developmental coaching. Sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it isn't. But certainly, as coaches, uh, it's our responsibility to work on ourselves to grow up. Because we will only be able to help people to grow up to the level that we have already grown to. It's extremely difficult, if not impossible, and some people say even unethical, to try to help someone to a higher level than you yourself know about. Clean up, 
Well, that's about all those kind of shadow aspects, perhaps they're often called, of all of us that we usually see out in the world. You know, all those really annoying things that other people do. Uh, all that, those bad feelings that seem to be out there and other people have. And, of course, as a human being, we share that. We share all of that. So, it's about taking what's ours, claiming what's ours, and being able to work with it. In fact, it only becomes a threat if it is not claimed. As soon as it's claimed, it's no longer a threat. So, taking back the projections that we make. And of course, not just the bad things, although these are sometimes the most obvious ones, but also the good things. Sometimes we see, you know, something fantastic out there and we're really fascinated by it. It's like, wow, wow, I'd really like that. Well, you actually, you've got that. You must have it, otherwise you could never see it and connect with it. It's there. And it's part of that. And it's again something to be claimed. Anything that provokes that kind of response, whether it's fascination and, and real interest, or, you know, ugh, no, I don't want that, we share that. We're all human. We all have this. Show up. Yes. Well, None of this means anything unless you actually go do something, unless you actually move, you know, creating into that space. So, two things about this. One is discipline, I think. A discipline in the sense of practice. I always had a trouble with the word practice when I was a guitar teacher. I would, you know, you say, say go, go and practice this piece. What does that mean? It's kind of like, what are you practicing for? You're doing it, right? If I go, if I go and practice a piece of music at home, I'm, I'm playing it. So, practice is is doing. There's no difference. It's just it's just a word. It's just a perspective. Repetition in the best way possible, in order to be able to do even better. And discipline, I think, is an interesting word. It uh, has the same root as disciple. So sometimes we think of, you know, oh, discipline, discipline, it's bad. It's, no, I, I'm not disciplined. You know. uh, dis root of the word discipline is love. Love. That's where discipline comes from. So, you know, continuing to show up, and perhaps as we get better at this, we still fall over, but at least we pick ourselves up quicker and we don't fall in the same hole again. And then actually embodying, actually taking action, actually doing something about this. Whatever it is, you know, if you don't take action, it, it remains, it just remains there. Take action, it works. So that showing up then becomes extremely important because those three before it need to be embodied. And the coach is going to model these things. And that's important. Um, I do a lot of travelling by aeroplane. And uh, for those of you who've been on an aeroplane, probably most people here, you know, before the aeroplane starts, you have the safety briefing, and uh, there's the there's the life jackets that are under your seats. Usually, even if you're not flying over water, but that's okay. Uh, in, <laughs> I went on one went on one short flight once, actually, <laughs> not in England, but they started off by saying, uh, "You won't find any life jackets under your seats because we're not going over water." and you won't find any oxygen masks because we're not actually going very high. <laughs> uh, 
um, but the oxygen mask, it's, uh, uh, it's usually there. And they always say, you know, in the event, in the unlikely event of an emergency, uh, the oxygen masks will drop from the ceiling and uh, put on your own mask first before you try and help anyone else. Because, you know, if you try and help somebody else, then maybe you'll pass out, you won't be able to help them, you haven't helped yourself. So we're back again to, you know, the metaphor of put on your own oxygen mask, have your own oxygen mask in place, work on yourself. Then you can help others. So, then if we move on from here, I would like to briefly go through a few things about leadership that I think as coaches we can model. And then I'm hoping that there'll be a few minutes left for questions. And I'm aware also in a conference like this that uh, if everybody takes five minutes more than the actual times, then by the end of the day, it can be a long time over. So I'm aiming to be pretty punctual. John sighs with relief there. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So I, this is, a, um, I think, a very nice metaphor for a leader as well, because um, a leader needs to match the worldview, first of all, you know, wherever they are themselves, without being able to match the worldview of those whom you are leading or working with, they're not going to take it. You, know, you need to create that connection first of all. So in that sense, if you can see our friend here, the chameleon. I, yeah, it's not so easy to see. Maybe you see him now. There's the eye at the top left going down. That's a chameleon. As you know, a chameleon has the ability to take on the context colours of where they are in order to hide. And I like the metaphor of an of a authentic leader as an authentic chameleon. <laughs> Which is kind of paradox, but I like paradoxes. Um, an authentic chameleon. No, it's a chameleon, right? It's okay. At the same time, you can take on you know, the worldview. You, you've got to connect with the people that you're going to be leading, you're going to be influencing, or you're going to be working with. To make that connection first, to be able to appreciate that worldview, not saying agree with it completely or get into it, we're just saying understand it, reflect it. But you're still a chameleon, you know, and you can still go another colour. What colour is a chameleon in a mirror? There's a question. I'll leave you with that one. <laughs> but think about it later, okay? Not now. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be all checking out here. We don't want that. Not just yet. Okay, so... This is, this is about that, that ability to match. So, you know, a question that might arise from that would be how... How adept are you at matching the worldview of the people that you want to lead? How adept are you? What could you do to work on that aspect that would help to match those people? Match first so that then you can lead them. No match, they won't follow you. And a leader, of course, is defined by the fact that they have followers. Otherwise, they're not a leader. Right? They're just someone wandering off on their own. So to get the followers, to, in, other, in other words, to be a leader, this is the start. Okay, moving on. So here's another distinction. I was talking about creating the future. So how far do we create ourselves? How far do we have this attitude of creativity towards our life as opposed to anything else, rather than to be always at effect of events that are happening to us? The victim here is always blaming, always seeing 
it's coming from outside, it's not my fault, somebody else, that's stronger, I had bad luck, it's all happening from the outside. Creator goes, okay, whatever happens on the outside, I am the cause here of what happens. I have choice about how I react and how I feel to what happens on the outside. Because if, if uh, you know, it's a, it's a devil's bargain, isn't it? If nothing was ever your fault, you'd have no power. You would be powerless. And then just moving to the next slide, because there's an interesting uh, set of distinctions here, I think, anyway, about that attitude of creation. And this is about, uh, of course, with, with coaching, uh, there's a lot of things about goals. We talk a lot about goals in coaching. Goals are what people want. And in a sense, you know, the vision that we have here is a very wide and inspiring goal. It's something that we're, we're working towards. So, as coaches, we help people with their goals. It's absolutely uh, crucial in terms of coaching and in terms of, you know, human beings operate with goals. They operate moving into the future. But sometimes we, we think about, you know, okay, there's me and there's the goal. And we forget about the relationship between the two. How do I relate to this imagined future? How do I relate to this goal? And to my mind, there's three main ways. One is acquisition. There's the goal out there, and I'm going to get it. It's almost like it's pre-existing. So, and, and I am reaching out, and I'm going to get it. So that's acquisition. I'm not saying anything wrong with that. It's a particular relationship that we create with our goals, and also perhaps uh, with... Uh, other people. Second possibility is attraction. And attraction has come very much to the fore recently, of course, with movies like The Secret and uh, attracting things into your life. And there's certainly some truth in that, although personally I think it's been uh, overstated in some ways. But there's certainly truth in that the way that you are thinking is going to change uh, and make a certain type of world, certain people will be attracted to you or not, certain things will happen. There's no doubt that uh, there's a kind of vibration there that connects. However, sometimes attraction can be used simply as a new age acquisition. Yeah? The still inside, you know, I want this thing, only now I can kind of sit back and attract it. And both of these, I think, uh, pale before that third relationship between ourselves and our vision, ourselves and our goals, what we can help our clients relate to their goals of creation. Because this is when, again, the power's in you. You, know? you create that. By moving towards that goal, you are creating it. By moving uh, in a coaching session with your client, you are co-creating that session and helping them to create their desired future. So that's about a way of thinking. And again, all the time here, I'm thinking about modeling coaches as models. And a model is a leader, uh, an aspect of leadership. What can... How do we think of our goals? Put it that way, there's another question. How do we think of our goals? How do we think of this vision? In terms of perhaps these three relationships, and I'm sure there are others. What would be the most useful way of relating to our vision that we have? Okay, moving on. Another key aspect, I think, of leading and certainly of coaching is making a distinction between agreements that we make and expectations that we have. Expectations are kind of one-sided agreements. If I expect something, then first of all, 
I don't have any power. It's, it's like, you know, I expect the sun to, to rise tomorrow, and that's fine. But I'm not actually going to do anything about it. I don't have to. And so expectation, when we deal in expectations, we tend to be passive. We tend to sit back and go, okay, this is going to happen. And then if, if it doesn't happen, we're disappointed. Yeah? Expectation is a uh, guaranteed way to be disappointed. If you get your expectations, it's not that exciting anyway, is it? Yeah? Oh, well, I got what I expected. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> so they're kind of losing out both ways. Agreement is different. Agreement is, again, between two people. You know? We agree to this. And I think it's very important, certainly something that I do in my coaching, is to be very clear about agreements, keeping agreements, you know, modeling keeping agreements. And then, then you can call your client on accountability. If you don't keep your agreements yourself, you can't call your client on the accountability issue. And that's one of the main functions of a coach, is to be an accountability partner to the client. To actually remind them, hey, you, you, know, you said this. Some, someone from the outside that knows as well. So it's about agreements. It's about keeping a, agreements or, if that's not possible, renegotiating them. Because sometimes, of course, it's difficult for one reason or another. Emergencies will happen, but then they need to be renegotiated. So this is, again, something we can model uh, for our clients. And I guess the question here would be, in your coaching practice, how far do you rely on agreements and how far do you rely on expectations? Another way of looking at that would be, how many times have you been disappointed? Even just a little bit. In what happened. Okay, briefly through the next two. I think that a leader and a coach enables clients to see both sides. It's not about one thing or the other. This is the way that clients create problems. In fact, it's been said that uh, a good coach helps a client to understand how that client has created their own problems. As soon as the client understands that, they can stop doing it. So, one way, certainly, that clients create problems is to think it's got to be that or it's got to be that. If it's not this, it's that. Whereas, in fact, this and that do not exist without the other one. Just like yin and yang. One side does not exist without the contrast. So, in any this or that, you know, for, every, for, every, for every this, there's always a that. And then you can get the the client to see the whole picture and not just one side of it. On again, power and force. Power comes from connection, lightning. Force comes from push. Power is about uh, drawing forward someone at moving towards the future, force is about pushing from behind. You know, leaders don't push from behind. Because if somebody pushes you from behind, what do you do? What do you automatically do when somebody pushes you from behind? You resist. Yeah? Automatically. It's an instinct. So, coaches, leaders, work with power. Which comes from many things, including presence and not force. Force is, is uh, a weakness. If you have to force something, it shows there's some weakness there. Okay, and I think i am finished this little presentation. We have 10 to 15 minutes for questions or comments. Um, I'm going to be around throughout the day with Andrea and our daughter Amanda, who many of you have met and or seen there at the front. That's my email address. Um, but I'm, you know, 
here want to talk to me, that's great. And we still have a few minutes if there are any comments or questions that anyone would like to make. John has the microphone. So I'll do all the talking now. Yeah. I don't see the really difference between the creation, attraction, and acquisition. Okay. It's, um, think of it as a relationship. Think about something you want. Do you think about it in terms of there it is and I'm going to get it? Do you think about there it is and I'm going to bring it to me? Or do you think about it's not actually there till I make it happen? That would be the kind of simple difference in my mind anyway. Does the is the future really there and we walk into it? Or do we actually create it? I would say that whatever, whatever it is, um, you get a more interesting, exciting and beautiful life if you think in terms of creation. On a similar point, can you clarify transactional coaching and performance coaching? Sure. Uh, performance coaching would... Performance coaching is, is more focused on a particular skill, um, very often in business. Transactional coaching is helping the client at multiple levels be the best they can be at that level, in terms of uh, my metaphor of you know, interior design of the apartment. Developmental coaching is helping them to move apartment and then probably uh, doing in some interior design on that apartment as well. The, apart the, the apartment you move to will have a greater perspective. You never move down. It's always up. Hi. C can you talk? Can you just put up your hand? Yeah, I'm here. No, just the person who's talking. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I get the voice. <laughs> okay. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the discipline and love? How is that connected? Well, one of my interests is language. So if, if I'm trying to look at something, I always look at, at where the root comes from, the root of the, of the language. And discipline uh, is the same root as disciple. So a disciple of Jesus was someone who followed them out of love. So rather than think of discipline as something I have to whip myself into doing because I ought to, which is the general idea about discipline in the culture, um, if you think about discipline as, I really love this, it's great, I want to do it, so then how will I set some kind of, of practice way of getting better at it. So, you know, when, when I played the guitar, I loved playing the guitar, and uh, someone could say there was a discipline to it. Um, yes, you have, to, you have to play some hours a day in order to get better. There's no shortcut. But I didn't have to force myself. Or those times where part of me didn't want to, to play, then I could... Uh, get some other parts of me that uh, did want to play and the democracy that is me would outvote the part that didn't want to. <laughs> Hi, um, you talked about uh, having your client or the organisation that you're a part of, the importance of matching them, of sitting with that camouflage. Mm. Um, how do you manage that? For me, what seems maybe a slight contradiction if that challenges your authenticity, your integrity, yourself, if the two are opposed? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's difference perhaps between matching and, and agreement. Um, if, if you're going to connect with someone, then you, you need to be able to understand their world, let's put it like that. 
yeah, uh, understand, acknowledge, don't argue. You know, you're not saying it's right, you don't have to agree, but you can, you can understand it. And therefore, by understanding it, you can enter into it. And therefore, by entering into it, you can help that person out of it if they want to come out. Okay. Hi. Um, I was interested by your, your vision of what expectation is. And what I heard you say is that it's something which is like an emotion, which is something which just happens and not actually over which the individual wouldn't have an influence over. And I'm interested as when contracting with the client at the beginning of a session, with when the agreement is made, I hear from you that in effect, the, expe the expectation the client has will not be influenced by this agreement. Or am I actually missing something? I've got some, a vision of a client coming with expectations of what mm -hmm. the coach will do for them, uh -huh. as yeah. opposed to what they do with the coach. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that agreement, which are, uh, will not actually affect the expectations, and therefore could there be a, a mismatch at the end of the contract, or actually throughout the contract where the client holds expectations which have not been altered at all with whatever agreement they've actually put in writing or, or else? Yes, I'm, uh, I take your point, uh, and uh, I probably wasn't so clear. Um, when I'm talking about agreement, I'm not talking necessarily about the contract or the, you know, the written thing that we all sign, if you have one. I'm not saying even you should, but um, I'm talking about, a, a, again, a attitude towards um, what we're going to do together. So, and, to, and really, to, to take it seriously, to take... Uh, for the client to be taken seriously and to take themselves seriously. So, for example, um, when I'm coaching clients, I ask them to send an email after each session as to what they got from the session, what was important. And I say, will you do that? And they go, yes. Now, that for me is an agreement. I say, will you do that? They go, yes. Fine. Now, you can see what happens. Sometimes they don't. Now, I can then say, we, we agreed you know, that you would send an email, so what happened? That was an agreement. It wasn't like uh, an expectation. It's not like, well, I hope you'll send me an email. If we actually have that agreement, then I can call them on accountability. And being able to keep agreements with other people is, is just the, the mirror image of keeping agreements with yourself. If you can't keep agreements with other people, you won't keep agreements with yourself. And then, again, you might, you might operate on expectations of yourself and be disappointed. It's better to have, uh, better to have agreements. <laughs> you know, agreements, they happen or, or are rene renegotiated. Yeah? They're, they're shared. Expectations are one-sided. So it's, and it's an attitude as well. We can talk about individual agreements and expectations, but as an attitude, I try to, uh, with my clients to make that, to give them that distinction so that they can start to apply it. <laughs>